Hello, and welcome to this video called Basics Boot Camp. My name is Peter Daye, and I'm a professional clarinetist here in San Diego. And with this video, I hope to teach you some um, really important fundamentals for clarinet playing. These are really basic ideas, but really, really important for playing well, producing a good sound, having a nice focus tone, having good clean fingers and technique, things like that. These might be things that you don't know, um, and I hope you learn from that. Or these might be things that you do know, and um, it's always a good reinforcer to hear these things again. So what I'd like to start with is just to talk a little bit about the embouchure and um, how to produce an embouchure, what a good embouchure is, things like that. So we always start with the lower lip, and the lower lip must be wrapped against the bottom teeth really firmly and tightly. So you want to think of Goldilocks here in that we don't want too much, we don't want too little, but it has to be just right. And what just right is, is if you think about the skin of your lip and the skin of your chin here, where you have that little line, where that line is, that's what you want to think about resting over your bottom teeth. And one exercise for that, really basic exercise, is if you just take your bottom lip, put it all the way in your mouth, and very slowly pull your lip out using these muscles here that we use to engage and hold the embouchure. So try this. All the way in, and all the way out, very slowly, until you reach that point where your lip and chin meet, that line there, and you want to rest that against your bottom teeth. Again, let's try that one more time. All the way in, and all the way out, until you reach there, and then you really want to hold that, okay? And then really use these muscles here on your chin and jaw to really engage and hold that lip in place. The other important thing is having the jaw pointed all the time. And again, we use these same muscles here to really develop that and hold that chin in place. So we want a pointed chin and a really firm lip. The importance of the chin is we, use, we point the chin so that we don't have too much jaw pressure on the reed. Um, if we have too much pressure, we might close off the reed, we'll have trouble getting air through the, through the mouthpiece, things like that. So you wanna make sure your jaw is nice and neutral, not clamping down or too tight, and that your lip is nice and pulled and firm. We want a really firm lip because we want a really hard surface for the reed to rest on, like this, so that um, the hard vibrating reed isn't stopped by a soft lip. We don't wanna absorb those vibrations. So we wanna keep the lip really firm and taut, nice and taut and firm, okay, just like that. The corners, you wanna think about smiling. Pulling your corners back toward your ears like you're smiling or saying E like that. So chin, uh, chin, lip, and corners all together. You wanna think about saying E and then ooh. So E, ooh. So your corners say E and your lips say ooh. So we don't wanna do E, ooh. We want E, ooh. So you keep your corners in place and then bring your lips forward for ooh. So e -u, like that. And then that sets the stage for just wrapping your lips around the mouthpiece like a drawstring, like a little bag with a string that you pull and it closes up. So the, the support around the mouthpiece comes from the lip muscles and not the jaw. What I see commonly with young players is they bite too much. We have too much jaw pressure and that again will affect the response, will affect your tone, your articulation. Basic, basic things of clarinet will be really impacted if you're biting a little bit too much. So keep that jaw nice and relaxed from, the, uh, from back here. Nice and stretched, lip wrapped, corners going back, and your front, front of your lips going ooh, nice and forward, and wrapping around the mouthpiece. So the top teeth have a very, very small job to do. They just rest on the mouthpiece, that's about it. We don't bite, we don't clamp down, we don't bring the weight of our head down onto the, onto the mouthpiece, just really gently, neutrally, poof, hanging there, okay? And one more thing about the mouthpiece is, uh, what I see with a lot of young players is um, they don't play with enough mouthpiece. So one thing you can do to see how much mouthpiece you need in the mouth is if you take your mouthpiece, your clarinet, and look through it sideways like this, um, you'll notice there's a little gap all the way at the top here, and that gap becomes smaller and smaller as you go down the reed. The point at which the reed and mouthpiece meet 
is called the point of resistance, and that point is where you want your bottom lip to be, at least at that point. So if we're play, if we're looking at it like this, I'm not sure if you can see very well, but let's see if that can focus. There we go. So there's a little tiny gap there. And if your bottom lip is maybe about here, what happens is when you go to play, you're gonna shut the mouthpiece. You're gonna shut the reed on the mouthpiece and you're not gonna get any air in there. So it's important that your bottom lip is a little bit farther down so that when you go to close up, we're not gonna shut the reed and you're gonna get all that air into the mouthpiece. One way to try this is um, through muscle memory, you're gonna learn and memorize how much you have to open the mouth, how far the mouthpiece goes in, all those things. And one example I like to use is, we've all seen those little uh, wooden wedge door stops in our classrooms. This is kind of the same thing. So this is the door stop and this is the door. So when we open the door, we put the door stop in and the door does not continue to close. So once we put the mouthpiece in, we don't shut and clamp down through practice and muscle memory, you'll remember how much you have to open and how much it goes in, and you'll just get it right every time after that. So after the mouthpiece goes in, the lips just wrap nice and firmly around the mouthpiece. We don't engage the jaw, so keep your jaw nice and neutral and out of the equation completely. And then finally, regarding jaw pressure, again, we want very little engaging of the jaw. We want to keep the jaw nice and loose. We don't clamp. One way to test this is if you're playing and you just kind of wiggle this around, if it wiggles like that, that's, that's too loose. You maybe want a little bit more grip, a little bit more firmness from the lips, but if your head shakes around with the mouthpiece, then you're gripping too much. So we want a nice happy medium, something just a light, lightly firm grip. When you're practicing, I suggest starting just with the mouthpiece and barrel. And if you have a tuner handy, you can test this. The mouthpiece and barrel should produce an F sharp on your tuner, a concert F sharp. So if you're looking at this tuner, I'm gonna play this little tiny instrument here. Now, intonation doesn't quite matter for this right now. It's going to be flat, it's going to be sharp, it's going to be a lot of things. But as long as it says F sharp, that's what you're aiming for. Let's try that one more time. Some student clarinets, um, cheaper quality models, um, sometimes you'll see a G, sometimes you'll see a really flat F sharp, things like that. Don't stress too much about it. You want whatever it says, you want to just produce a really nice steady tone, not a tone that's wobbly or bumpy and lumpy, just something nice and steady. And we'll get to that a little bit later once we start talking about the air. So moving on now, um, a sometimes overlooked idea is the this idea of the inner embouchure. So we know the embouchure as the outside, but what happens inside is equally as important. So um, some things to keep in mind here are um, you want to keep your tongue in a really high arched position inside the mouth so looking like a roller coaster like this so the air comes up the throat comes up the mouth and then down the tongue shoots into the mouthpiece this is really important because for a lot of younger players we keep the tongue kind of in a flat uh, position inside the mouth and the way that uh, moves the air is kind of like this we shoot onto the reed we want to be directing that air into the mouthpiece. And one way to achieve that is by maybe thinking um, words like he or we or key or hissing like a cat even, he. Because what that does, it's gonna arch your tongue, it's gonna bring the sides of your tongue to touch your back top teeth, which is where we want it. Nice and high and arched in the back of the mouth. What that does is, again, it speeds up the air, it focuses the air, which are all really important things we want for the clarinet. What's important here is that since the tongue is now arched, the tip of the tongue should float behind the bottom teeth. We don't ever want to let the tongue rest inside the mouth. Very important that we don't do that because that's going to later impact your tonguing. Sometimes 
Um, you might have heard of things like anchor tonguing. Anchor tonguing is where the tip of the tongue is resting um, on the bottom of your mouth behind your bottom teeth, and then you tongue with the middle of your tongue. That's not going to give you a clean, light articulation. You want to keep the tip of your tongue floating so that it's ready to articulate when you need to. So moving on now to um, the blowing mechanism for the clarinet. Um, you might have heard a lot of band directors or players talk about using warm air for the clarinet. Um, that's not a really good idea because the, the mechanics of producing warm air aren't really correct for the mechanics of playing the clarinet. So warm air is very slow, it's very wide, there's no focus in it. We want to always think for the clarinet really fast, cold, dense air. And the way we achieve that is by really engaging the core. So the core is your abdominal muscles, your side muscles, uh, the obliques, the muscles between your ribs, the intercostal muscles, your back muscles, your diaphragm especially. All these things here in the middle of your body, the core, are what we engage to really speed up that air. So if you think about maybe if you're blowing on something hot in front of you to cool it down, what happens in your belly when you blow cold air? Try blowing warm air, like you're fogging up a mirror, and then try to blow really cold, fast air. And I want you to feel what's happening inside. There's an engaging that happens in the belly. That's what we want. We want to really exaggerate that squeezing feeling as if you're being prepared to be punched in the stomach. That's what you want to do. You want to really flex the middle of your body. That's going to speed up your air. That's going to give you a really dense, uh, cold air stream that we need for the clarinet. That, in addition to the arched tongue, are really going to produce a nice, fast air stream. And that's what's going to give you a nice, full, supported tone. So what can we do then to uh, reiterate and really practice all these things together? One really good basic exercise that we've all heard of is just simple long tones. Long tones are very simple technically. They have very little to do with the fingers so that they allow you to just focus on one or two things at a time. In this case being embouchure and air. So with your long tones what you want to listen for is a really clear steady tone, a tone that looks and sounds like this, not bumpy, not wavy, not lumpy, any of that. And that comes from your jaw, your embouchure, your tongue position, all those things being nice and still and firm, and your air being nice and steady and strong. And that's what really one of the easiest ways to practice um, learning your embouchure and your air. And one just really simple long tone exercise would be to just take a scale, any scale, a chromatic scale, a major scale that you're working on, it doesn't matter what it is, and just practice it one breath per note. So you're going to hold out a note for a full exhalation, full breath, and then once you're out of air, take a few seconds, breathe, fill back up, go on to the next note, same thing. And that whole time just listening for the clarity of your tone, the steadiness of your tone, feeling your air being nice and steady, feeling your muscles engaged, feeling your chin and your embouchure nice and steady, nothing's moving around, that's what's going to give you the best tone possible. So moving on now to um, hand position. So we've got the mouth, the blowing out of the way, let's move on to the hands. And this is where, um, again, everything's important, this is where uh, some things are going to make you or break you as a clarinet player. So hand position is really, really important for a lot of reasons. And we're going to start with the top hand, your left hand. Um, with your left hand, you want to make sure your hand is slightly angled on the clarinet. So we don't want a flat hand position like this. You want your hand to be a little bit angled. There's a few reasons for that. First of all, this key right here is not in line with the rest. See how it's a little bit pulled out? These are nice and straight. And then this guy just Boop, goes out to the side. The reason for that is because the clarinet is designed to be held a certain way. If our left hand is flat like this, first of all, this finger becomes too long and we overshoot this key. But if our hand is flat, we can't really use these keys here. So because of that, we need to angle our left hand so that we can easily access these keys here. But then so that our ring finger, our fourth finger, is perfectly in place for this tone hole here. The reason we want our hand angled is because, again, for accessing these three keys here, but more importantly, 
is to allow you to roll and cross the brake more easily. If your hand is flat, this rolling idea becomes really difficult to do and crossing the brake might be problematic for you if you have that issue. Think about your hand position. So slightly angled like this. One exercise you might want to try, it's really simple. Just put your hand in front of you, bring your wrist down like this, and then pull your wrist back toward you. And that's going to help you learn this hand position, but also to keep your wrist low and wrapped around the clarinet. We don't want elevated wrists like this. You want your wrist nice and neutral, okay? The fingers should be nice and rounded. We don't want flat fingers. We want nice, uh, gently rounded fingers like this. The fingers, how we move the fingers, you want to think of your fingers or your knuckles as, as if they're a hinge. And so if the fingers are rounded, we only move from this hinge. We never move from the front knuckles, only ever the back knuckle. And we do that to preserve that rounding of the fingers. If your fingers become flat, this is not good because this translates into really mushy, slow technique. And we're gonna hear that. We're gonna hear uh, slow note transitions, slow break crossings, slow leaps, things like that. And even sometimes squeaks. This is really, really a big culprit sometimes for squeaks because if we close like this, see that? It's almost like two actions. We have the initial down and then another movement in the knuckle there. And what happened, what, what this causes is that the tone hole is not closing all the way right away. So maybe the front of the hole closes then the back of the hole. So to eliminate that, we want to make sure our fingers stay round and they move only from one place. Same idea for the bottom hand, except the bottom hand, we don't really angle too much. The bottom hand stays nice and straight, but again, fingers are nice and rounded. We have a lot of space in the palm. Keep your palm nice and open, not crushed like that. Nice and open and neutral. Again, so that our fingers stay nice and rounded and we're not flattening or collapsing our fingers. And always, regardless of the speed of the music, if you're playing slow notes, fast notes, whatever, it doesn't matter, the fingers always move in a really quick manner. So even if you're playing something really slow, the fingers always move really quickly. And that's really important because, again, if you're playing something slow, if your fingers move slowly, you're gonna hear some fuzz, um, some maybe even a glissando or even a squeak. So it's really important that your fingers move very quickly and no changes happen very quickly when we're playing the clarinet. Finally, the pinkies, really important for the pinkies that again, these also remain curved. You don't wanna keep your pinkies nice and straight like that because that causes a lot of tension, first of all, but also it makes it really difficult to reach these pinky keys, especially the ones down here in the right hand. If our pinkies are flat, or I mean straight, it's really hard to reach, especially this one, because you run out of room. So you want to keep your pinkies really rounded, but also you want to aim for just the very edges of these pinky keys. And that's going to help keep your pinkies rounded and give you enough space to move about the clarinet. And finally, what I want to talk about is just some general ideas of practicing. Um, when I was younger, I used to get really tired uh, practicing for a long time. So um, what I've learned in my experience is always take breaks. Breaks are really, really important to clear your mind, to come back to the instrument fresh. So what I do is about every hour I take 10 minutes off or every 30 minutes, five minutes off if you're only practicing for 30 minute chunks. But if you're doing longer, you wanna take longer breaks. So my rule is every hour I take 10 minutes off. So I'm practicing 50 minutes at a time, 10 minutes. I leave my practice space, I leave the clarinet, I leave my studio, I get away from the clarinet, I clear my mind, I stand in the sun, I go outside, I do just something different to get away from whatever it is that's causing me stress or whatever it is that I'm really focused on, you just need to clear your mind. So it's always good to, well, and also give yourself a rest. Very, very important that we don't overexert ourselves because you could really easily injure yourself playing the clarinet. Always start your practice sessions with a few goals in mind. Could be one goal, could be two goals, could be three, doesn't matter, but always have 
some sort of direction or focus before you even start. It's also always really, really important to have a direction for your practicing. Today I'm going to work on long tones. Today I'm going to work on this scale. Today I'm going to work on these specific fingerings. Whatever it may be, always start with a list. Really, really important that you have that direction and you're not trying to do a million different things. And finally, um, this idea of practicing. So I talk about this a lot with my younger students, um, how effectively and efficiently you can practice. Nobody wants to practice three, four hours a day. No one has that time, right? So this idea of um, mindful versus mindless practicing. So when you think of mindful versus mindless, what are some things that come to mind? I think mindless is just you're doing things by rote. You're just doing the motions, thinking about other things. Oh, what's for dinner? What's my cat doing? Things like that. And you're not really engaged, but mindful practicing is you're in the moment, you're engaged, you're, you're thinking about what you're doing, you're hyper-focused, you're fixing problems, things like that. An hour of mindful practice is worth so much more than two hours of just mindless whatever kind of practicing. So always keep your practice really focused, really intense, um, always fixing problems. If something's really easy for you, don't spend time working on it. That's a waste of your time. So you can spend that time more wisely working on something that is more difficult or something that needs work. So I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope you learned a few things um, or I hope this reinforced some things that you already knew. If you have any questions, my contact info is with the appropriate people and um, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Again, my name is Peter Daye and this was Basics Bootcamp and happy practicing. See you later.